Good morning. This is my second worship service in the last 48 hours. We went and saw David Crowder on Friday. 90 minutes. And we're going there. We get on the little tram to go from the parking lot to Emmons and the guy who's doing the bus, doing the ride. I said, do you know who David Crowder is? And he said, no. I said, well, are you going to go? He said, yeah, I'm going to go listen to him. I said, it's 90 minutes of worship. Crowder's amazing, but he's not my favorite worship leader. King David's my favorite worship leader. Listen to what he said. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I rejoice when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. This is a time of rejoicing for us. Let's go ahead and stand up and rejoice. We've waited for this day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our praise. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face. We're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Show us, show us your glory. Show us. Show us your power, show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory, show us, show us your power, show us, show us your glory, Lord. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Let's pray. Father God, we're so glad we're here to worship you. Father, show us your glory. Reveal to us more about who you are. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Well, we're going to start this morning. Uh, we have a baptism from one of our, our students, so that's exciting. Uh, Gracie Hill is one of our seventh graders now who uh, has a desire to be baptized. In Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter is giving the very first gospel message, telling the people about Jesus. And at the end, the Jewish leaders uh, say, well, they're cut to the heart, they're convicted, and they say, what, do we, what should we do? What do we do about this? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Gracie's heard the message of Jesus. She's been coming to youth group. She's been coming to Bible discovery. And she's been hearing about Jesus. And, and she now has the same desire that those Jewish people had on the day of Pentecost. She wants to make Jesus her Lord. And so she's coming into the waters of baptism this morning to do just that. So 
Uh, I'm going to take Gracie's confession. Uh, so, Gracie, do you believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes. That's awesome. Will you now repeat that great confession after me? I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. And I now accept him. And I now accept him. As my personal Lord and Savior. As my personal Lord and Savior. That's awesome. Let's clap for her for that. Let's pray for Gracie here this morning. Father, we thank you so much that we were able to witness such an amazing thing, uh, uh, another life uh, devoting themselves to you, of wanting to make Jesus their Lord and Savior. We pray for Gracie, we celebrate with her, but we, we pray for her as now we know the enemy is not happy that another soul has come to Jesus Christ. And so I pray that we can be a support for her as her family, uh, her spiritual family, that we can welcome her into the, the household of God, your church. Uh, and giving her support and prayer as she starts this journey. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have heard uh, Pope made a comment here recently that there are many ways to Jesus, many ways Jesus. And I would just have to tell you the Bible disagrees with that. Jesus said in John, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There's only one person who was born a virgin, according to the fulfillment of prophecy, and that was Jesus. Only one man who lived a sinless life. Only one man who died for our redemption. Just one, Jesus Christ. He is the way for us to find our way to the Father. And so as we sing this next song... You'll be hearing that word one, and I just want you to think about the fact that there's no other way. If there was another way to God besides Jesus, the cross was futile. What was the point of him going to the cross? He went to the cross because that was the way for us to have our sins washed away so we could come back to God. So let's celebrate that and worship as we sing this next song. There is one salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in the crucifixion. By his blood I have been set free. I believe in the resurrection. Hallelujah, his life is death's defeat. All praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. I believe in the hope of heaven. He's preparing a place for me. Far beyond what hearts imagine, ears have heard or eyes have seen. All praise to God the Father, 
All praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome, the King who was and is and evermore will be, in Jesus' mighty name I believe, in Jesus' mighty name I believe. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship Him.
earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. stand with me as I say a prayer. Heavenly Father, we stand before you just in all of who you are and the things that you do. God, we thank you for this service that we can come together and that we can witness new life in you, that we can sing praises to you, that we can listen to your word and dig deep into your truth. But God, let us have open ears and hearts to hear what you want us to. God, to speak into our lives so that we will be changed, that we don't stay the same. God, we all have different stories. We're all on different paths, but God, I pray that they all lead to you. And so may we take this time to just be able to say, it is well with my soul. Some of us may have came in here with some hard things that happened on the way here, maybe this week or there's in a season where things are just hard. But even so, we can say it as well because we know who wins. God, we know who holds the hope for us. And I thank you for that. And I just pray for the rest of the service, God. May it just glorify and honor you because you are such an amazing God and you are just worthy of it all. And we just pray all this in your son's precious name. Amen.
good morning. Am I good? Come on. Perfect. Uh, today's a Youth Sunday, in case you haven't noticed. We've had a number of <laughs> up on. Awesome. I always love when we get to see that. Uh, I see them leading worship every Sunday night, and so it's great that we get to see them on stage this morning. Uh, we've got other teens involved. We'll, we'll get to hear one of our, our youth give the communion meditation later. And during my message, I have five teens who will be coming up and reading scripture for me throughout the message. So we have that to look forward to. Uh, I don't know about you, but I like to receive good news. I like good news, especially, you know, if you have to take good news or bad news. I'd much rather take good news over bad news. But I want you to take a second to think about the greatest news that you've ever heard or ever received in your life. Take a second, think about it. I know for me, I can think of many times in my life where I heard great news. And great news can be really exciting. And it can be really life-changing depending on, on what it is. Like when a high school graduate is accepted, they get that letter from the college of their choice saying that they got accepted. That's an exciting thing. Or when they start their freshman year at college. Or when you get a promotion at work or you get a raise at work. Those things are all really, really exciting. As well as when a married couple finds out that they are pregnant. I mean, good news is exciting and can be really life-changing. And when I get good news, I like to share that good news with others. I have a hard time keeping it to myself because good news is fun. It's great. And I want somebody to share in the excitement, share in the joy that I experienced when I received it. And back in August of 2021, when Angelina and I were interviewing here at, at University Christian Church uh, for me to come as youth pastor, we, we flew up here in August uh, for a kind of a final interview and to meet people. And when we got word that after that weekend that we were hired as, that I was hired as youth minister here, we definitely did not keep that news to ourselves. I remember calling my mom and my dad and calling my in-laws. Uh, as soon as we got to Indianapolis airport, I called them to tell them the good news. Because I wanted them to share in our joy, to share in our excitement that we just received. And listen, I think that sharing the good news or good things that have happened in our lives with other people, I think that that's just kind of natural. We just have a natural desire to do that, to want others to experience what we experience. It's what happens when we feel like we have something super important to share with somebody else because we think that they can find joy and they can find some meaning in it as well. And this morning, I want to look at, and what I want to share with you is the importance of reproducing our faith, your faith, and others. Sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with them. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at our list of 10. That's the series we're in. It's our list of 10 characteristics that we believe describe every mature Christ follower. And last week, Michael led us through numbers 4 and 6 on our list. And this morning, we'll be taking a look at numbers 9 and 10, which are number 9, ongoing community service, and number 10, personal outreach to your impact list. And that's what I mean when I say reproducing your faith in others. It's all about evangelism. That's what I'm talking about. A couple of weeks ago, Steve looked at the importance of being discipled and entering into a discipleship group so that you can grow in your faith more intentionally. But today we're looking at not at being discipled, but rather making disciples. And that's what I mean by reproducing our faith, going out, telling others about Jesus, sharing the good news with them, making disciples. And see, this isn't on our list for no reason. I mean, this is exactly what Jesus wants for us to go out and do. I'm going to have James Sue come up to the mic to read for us what Jesus says to the disciples right before he, send, he ascends into heaven. So James, you can go ahead and, and read that for us. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus tells, out to, he tells us to go out and to reproduce 
our faith, to go and make disciples. That's our mission. That's what every Christian is called to do. And we can do that through our words and through our conversations with others that we know don't believe in Jesus. But I think in another way, that can be done through our service. And again, this is for every Christian. Every single believer in Jesus Christ is called to share their faith and their belief with others. You know, we have a mission statement in our church, but I think this is where it comes from. This is the real mission, the mission that Jesus has given us to go and make disciples. And I believe that going out and making disciples is part of the natural process of Christian maturity. I think that if we're truly living in a relationship with God, growing closer to him, getting to know him, then we will naturally go out and reproduce our faith in other people. We will go out and evangelize, share the good news. And I think that our relationship with God, growing in that, experiencing the goodness of who he is, that should be the biggest motivating factor in our desire to go and evangelize. And the rest of this morning, to kind of illustrate what I mean in this, is I want to go through the story of the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah, Isaiah shares the testimony of his own calling. And he gives us immense insight into his relationship and his understanding of God. And I believe it's those two things, his relationship and his understanding of God, that motivates and drives him to go out and tell other people about God so that they can experience the same thing he's experiencing. I believe it's these four key truths that ought to motivate each believer to go out and tell, the, tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. So if we want to go out and reproduce our faith in others, which Jesus has asked us to do, I'll say commanded actually, then I think we need to recognize and believe and understand these four things, two truths about God and two truths about ourselves. So with that in mind, let's start looking at Isaiah's story. Like I said, I've got four students now who are going to come up and read the story of Isaiah for us. So Lauren, if you want to make your way up to the mic, we're going to look at his story one section at a time. So Lauren's going to read the first section, and then we'll talk about that. Then I'll have another student come up and read the next section, and we'll talk about it. So that, that's how this is going to work. So we're going to look at the first section of Isaiah's story. Lauren, go ahead and read that for us. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on the throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. This is the first part of Isaiah's vision, and I absolutely love this passage of scripture. It's a very personal passage for me. That when I felt called to ministry, this was the story that had an immense impact on my calling. And I know that's not just for me. I know there's many other pastors who can point to this story and say, this has had an immense impact on my calling. When we look at this vision, we need to start thinking of Isaiah kind of as an artist. Like a painter who's painting a picture for us. Because that's what he's doing here in these first four, four verses. He's painting a picture of God so that we can understand. And it's in this vision that he's had we come across the first truth that we need to recognize, I think, in order to go out and, and reproduce our faith. And that is that we need to recognize that God is holy. That's the most important thing Isaiah wants us to get out of these first four verses. If we want to reproduce our faith in others effectively, if we want to fulfill the mission that Jesus has given us in Matthew 28, of course we need to first recognize who God is. We need to recognize and understand and believe that he is holy. How can we go out and tell others about him if we don't know who he is? And in Isaiah's vision, the holiness of God permeates throughout the entire thing. It's such an important piece for Isaiah in his understanding of God. In fact, Isaiah calls God the Holy One of Israel more than anybody else in the Old Testament, and it's over 20 times in his book that he calls him the Holy One of Israel. It seems to be his favorite way to describe God throughout his ministry. And it's believed that Isaiah calls him the Holy One of Israel so many times because of this vision. This vision had such an impact on Isaiah that he can't help but 
think about it each time he's thinking about who God is. And in these four verses, Isaiah is painting a beautiful picture and an intense picture of the holy God. From the very first sentence of chapter 6, we see it clearly. He says, the Lord is high and exalted. God being holy means he's utterly and uniquely set apart from sin and from the world. He's so vastly different. He's the total opposite of sin and the opposite of us. And Isaiah demonstrates this differentness. Is that a word? Differentness? You be the judge. And he demonstrates this by contrasting King Uzziah and Yahweh God. He starts off with King Uzziah the year he died. A man living in this world, someone corrupted by sin, dies. And in contrast, he moves to Yahweh God who's on the throne, high and exalted. Our holy God is, is king in a way that puts human kings and leaders to shame. The one corrupted by sin dies. The holy God who's not lives forever. While human kings are on the throne for a short while, the holy God is on the throne for eternity. That's what Isaiah is trying to communicate to us. Our God, the true king of the universe, is so much greater than any other leader and king in this world because he is the eternal king. He will never be dethroned. He is always high and exalted. But Isaiah doesn't stop there. He continues to use imagery to make it clear to us that he's holy. He also says in verse 1 that the train of God's robe fills the temple. It's commonly believed that the temple being mentioned here isn't Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. So get that out of your mind because that's not what he's talking about. But that Isaiah is having a vision of God in his heavenly throne room. He's up in heaven seeing God in his heavenly temple. And yet in this heavenly throne room, which I can only imagine is a lot larger than Solomon's temple, he says that the train of his robe fills the room. I want you to think about just how massive that is. I mean, put that into your understanding. The train of his robe fills the whole room. And another way to translate the Hebrew there is not the train of his robe, but the corner of his garment filled the temple. Maybe that puts it into perspective. Now, I don't know about you, but the corner of my garment can't fill this room, let alone God's heavenly throne room. That would be, I'm just saying, that would be a shirt that is just a, a few sizes too large for me to wear. But once again, this shows just how holy God is. The holiness of God. He's so much greater than anything we can think of. So different. So set apart. And then Isaiah sees bright and fiery angels called seraphim. The Hebrew word that, that comes from is seraph, which means to burn. And so Isaiah describes these angels as bright beings like fire, a, a sort of pure being. And these angels are covering their faces and they're covering their bodies as they fly above the throne room of God. Now, Old Testament scholars seem to agree that the reason these seraph or seraphim were covering themselves is because they were in the presence of the holy God. In other words, this is not what they usually do, but because they're in the presence of the holy God, they cover their face, they cover their feet. It was the custom of the ancient Near East that when you approach a king, you come in reverence. You come covering yourself. That was the tradition in Isaiah's time. That's why when they, they bowed so low and they put their head down, so they covered their face and they would come in with robes that covered the entirety of their body all the way past their feet so that at no point was their body exposed before the authority they presented themselves before. Out of sign of respect and reverence. And God's angels in heaven feel the need to cover themselves before the holy presence of God. They cover themselves because they recognize that even these pure beings are not worthy to be in the presence of the almighty holy God. But they don't stop there. In case there was any doubt, they go on to sing it plainly for us in verse 3. They begin to sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. They sing about His holiness three times. Not to make sure that we don't forget it. I think by this point, Isaiah has painted a picture 
we can't possibly forget. But to try it and teach us exactly just how holy God is. Most Hebrew scholars agree that the repetition of the word holy three times in the song is meant to show us that God's holiness and how holy he is isn't even something that's comprehensible to our minds. In other words, God is so holy that when we say God is holy, that barely scratches the surface when talking about how holy God is. It barely even puts it into a picture. It doesn't even do it justice to describe who God is and how holy he really is. And to wrap it all up at the declaration of God's holiness, the entire heavenly throne room begins to shake before God. Just the presence of the holy God makes the heavenly throne room tremble. And the prophet Nahum writes something similar. In Nahum chapter 1 verse 5, he says, The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Why? Not because God is so scary. It's not trembling because God is terrifying. It's trembling because he's so different so much higher than anything else, so holy that everything feels unworthy to be there when he approaches. We serve and worship a mighty and a holy God and just his holiness alone, I think, should be motivation enough to go out and to tell others about who God is. There are people outside these walls in this community that don't know the holy God. They don't know about his holiness. They don't know how awesome he is. Just understanding that should motivate us to want to go out and tell others about who he is. Because we know, and how could we possibly keep that to ourselves? Understanding and recognizing his holiness ought to motivate us to go and reproduce our faith in others because we know who this God is. And I can't believe there are people who don't. But when it comes to Isaiah's story, we see the angels covering themselves before God. But did you notice something about Isaiah? He's uncovered. He stands before the holy presence of God uncovered. He's underdressed in the presence of the holy God. So now there's a natural tension. What's going to happen to Isaiah? Well, let's find out together as Madeline comes up and reads Isaiah 6, 5 for us. Keep that tension in mind. What's going to happen? Go ahead, Madeline. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. If you could understand that through the ringing, you would have caught that Isaiah recognizes he's a sinner in the presence of the Holy God. And that leads to the second truth that we need to recognize. That we need to recognize a truth about us. That we are sinners. We need to recognize who God is. He's holy. And we need to recognize who we are. Sinners. The holy presence of God and sin cannot coexist together. That's the tension we're feeling in the story. That is why when Adam and Eve sinned, they were cast out of the Garden of Eden. And Isaiah realized that he was a sinner in the holy presence of of God. He calls himself unclean. He's the total opposite of the holy God, who is the definition of clean. He's corrupted by sin, tainted and polluted, and yet he's in the presence of God. Notice his response. He doesn't think he deserves to be there. And he's right. He doesn't deserve to be there. He's afraid. He says, I am ruined. And the English translation of that phrase, I am ruined, doesn't even begin to bring to light the kind of intensity of the word Isaiah is using. It's not just ruined, but it's almost a sort of total obliteration. He doesn't think he's just going to be ruined. He thinks he's going to be totally obliterated because he's in the presence of the Holy God. But he only recognizes this truth because he properly understands the holiness of God. See, if he had no understanding of how holy God was, he would feel no shame in the presence of God. He needed to understand that truth first, to understand exactly what kind of trouble he was in. 
He properly understands the seriousness and the weight of his sin because he first encountered the holiness of God. And Isaiah's response is the proper response. He should be afraid because he knows what happens to sin when it's in the presence of God. The complete holiness of God is overwhelming to Isaiah, who's a complete sinner. If the seraphim called God holy, 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 as a way for us to show we can't even comprehend how holy he is, then I think Isaiah can properly be described as sinner, sinner, sinner. And so now we have a dilemma, an intense problem. What's going to happen to Isaiah? We know what he feels like. He, he, we feel, he knows what we feel should happen. He sticks out like a sore thumb. The heavenly host obviously recognizes that he's there. I mean, how, how are they going to miss that? So what's going to happen? Well, we'll cover that in a moment. Cliffhanger, I'll you know, leave it hanging for you to, to wonder about. But first I want you to see why it's important that we recognize we are sinners when we go out to share our faith with other people. Why that's important for proper evangelism and the true reproduction of our faith in others. Because I think there are too many Christians today who go out into the world to evangelize, but all they do is condemn and judge the lost that they're evangelizing to. Church, that's not a good approach. We can't forget that when we go out to evangelize, that we too are sinners and we're sinners in their shoes needing to be saved. The Apostle Paul says this to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. He says, do you not know, and he's talking to the church, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? The wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he goes on to say to them in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, again, talking to the church, talking to the Christians, and that is what some of you were. We can't forget that we too were and are sinners. That when we go out to seek and save the lost, to tell them about Jesus, we need to remember we were once in the same boat they were, trapped in our sin with no hope. We were like Isaiah in his story. We were faced with the holiness of God and with our sin. And so we realize that we too deserve the judgment from the holy God. We need to remember that when we tell others about Jesus, we have to remember this so that we can sympathize with them, connect with them, tell them about how you recognize that you needed a savior in order to free you and save you from the wrath of the holy God. And that same escape is offered to them. God and sin cannot coexist together. That brings us back to Isaiah. What's gonna happen to him? If God and sin cannot be in the same place, what's gonna happen? Let's find out together. Let's have Wyatt make his way up. He's going to continue the story of Isaiah. We're going to see exactly what happens. Isaiah 6, verse 6 to 7. Go ahead, Wyatt. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken, from, taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Wow. That part of the story always amazes me. That when Isaiah thought his life was over because of his sin, when he thought he was trapped and hopeless because of his own wickedness, God spared him. God had mercy on him. That's the third truth we need to recognize and to remember. That we need to recognize that God is merciful. It's the second truth about God we need to understand. See, all seemed hopeless for Isaiah. He deserved to be ruined. He deserved to be totally obliterated, as he said. Because he was in the presence of a holy God as a sinner. He did not come before God in reverence and awe in the way that he presented himself. Remember, the angels covered themselves before God. But Isaiah stood before God exposed and in filthy rags. We want to put imagery on it. Filthy rags. Because later in the book, we see Isaiah say this. Isaiah 64, verse 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean, the way he describes himself in Isaiah 6. 
and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Isaiah stood before the holy king of the universe in filthy rags, actually less than that because he felt he wasn't righteous at all. He deserved to be cast out. And he was unworthy to be there. He didn't belong up there. And he knew it. And so did God. And yet, despite that, the holy God showed he was merciful. In the midst of his heavenly throne room, where sin did not belong, but yet was there, God chose to be merciful to Isaiah and forgive his sins so that he could remain there, so that he could be there in his presence. Isaiah did not belong there. He was unworthy to be there. I hope you're getting the point. That's why I keep saying. But yet God made a way for him to stay there. God wanted him to be there. But while the holiness of God and the sin of humanity, while that was clashing and we had tension with one another, making a relationship with God impossible, the mercy and the love of God came up with a way to still show justice while showing mercy. One of the seraphs took a burning coal from the altar and he touched Isaiah's lips with it, purifying and cleansing him of his own guilt and sin. Why his lips? Well, Isaiah said he was a man of unclean lips, so he touched his lips, purifying him. Now that's absolutely amazing. A guilt-ridden Isaiah is told, your guilt is taken away. Wow. When you understand the mercy and the love of God in light of his great holiness, it makes his mercy seem that much greater. We have no right to be in relationship with God. He has absolutely no reason to even interact with us. We are all unworthy to be in his presence. None of us belong in heaven. Not one of us deserves his love and his grace. Yet because he's holy and because he is a good and awesome God, he made a way through Jesus Christ, his son, to allow us to enter into his presence, to be called his sons and his daughters. And even though we've been washed in the blood of Christ, make no mistake, we are still unworthy of him. We still don't deserve to be in heaven with God for eternity. But praise God for Jesus Christ, that we might be found righteous in him and through him alone. That when I come before God on the day of judgment, I won't be coming in filthy rags because Christ will be my clothes. We aren't worthy, but because Jesus Christ is worthy, the only one who's worthy, we have access to the throne room and the presence of our Heavenly Father. In church, again, there are people who don't know this in our community, who have never been taught this. There are people who don't know about the grace and about the love of God given and shown through Jesus Christ. People are missing out on the greatest possible thing in life, a relationship with the Almighty God. How can we not be moved? Understanding what's happened to us, how can we not be moved to go out and tell them this amazing news? If I was willing to tell my mom and dad and my in-laws about getting accepted for a job, I ought to be motivated to go out and share this news with others. It's much greater news. Yes, they are sinners, but so are we. Yes, they don't deserve to be saved, but neither do we. None of us have the right to call God our Father. Only Jesus Christ has that right. But he's given us that privilege. And he wants others to be called his children as well. I think Jesus wants everyone in Muncie, everyone in Yorktown, and wherever else we find ourselves to be the children of God. That's his desire. The incredible mercy of God shown to us ought to be the reason why we go out and share this with others. Because that's the loving thing to do. It's unloving to not tell someone when we know about the mercy and the grace of God, knowing full well they are on the path to hell. We need to speak up. We need to tell others. There are lost souls all around us who desperately need to know Jesus and need to know our Father. And this is exactly what Isaiah realizes next in his vision. So as Caleb makes his way up to read for us, to set the scene now that 
Isaiah's sin has been dealt with, the courtroom of God is convening, planning to meet. Because God needs someone to go out and to do a special task on his behalf. Let's find out what that is. Go ahead, Caleb. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here, here am I. Send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull, and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. God wants to send someone to go out and be his messenger to the people. That's the task. He says, go and tell these people. And I find it so striking how quickly Isaiah accepts the charge. So quickly. I mean, think back to Moses in the burning bush. Moses was a little little hesitant to be his messenger, coming up with excuse after excuse. Or the prophet Jeremiah, who was also hesitant to accept the call, thinking he was too young to do it. But not Isaiah. Isaiah willingly offers his service. And I find it interesting that in the case of Moses and Jeremiah, God approaches them and says, be my messenger. But that's not what happens in Isaiah's story. He merely asks a question to his courtroom. Who will go and speak for us? And it's Isaiah I think who eagerly and willingly says, I will, I'll be the guy. That's the fourth and the final truth we need to recognize this morning. We need to recognize that we are now witnesses because we've experienced the holiness of God, because we understood we were sinners, not deserving God's mercy, and because we received his mercy anyway. We're now witnesses. We should be witnesses to that fact. Isaiah was so willing to go and be a messenger of God because something incredible just happened to him. He had a real encounter with the intense holiness of God. He recognized that he is a real sinner in comparison to the holiness of God, that he's unworthy and undeserving. And he'd been shown mercy and forgiveness for his sins, which he was guilty of. Isaiah recognized something amazing happened. And because of that, he had a desire to serve the one who saved him as a result. Out of gratitude, he felt because a sinner like him was forgiven, he willingly and quickly stepped up to the task of being God's witness to the people. And I think that every mature believer will be reproducing their faith in others because a mature believer understands what these truths mean and have experienced this for themselves. Mature believers recognize how much they've been forgiven and can't help but feel a desire to go and share that with others, just as Isaiah felt here. I believe, if we're talking about natural processes, I believe this is the natural process of maturity for a Christian. How can we hold on to such amazing news when we have it? If we want to go out and reproduce our faith in others, we need to ask ourselves if we fully understand and recognize that Isaiah's story is our story. That none of us deserve the salvation that we've been given. And if sinners like us can receive salvation, why shouldn't we go out and tell others that they can also receive that salvation? James read the Great Commission for us in Matthew 28. The commission that Jesus has given to every single believer He wants us to be telling others about him and planting seeds in the hearts of the lost around us. He wants us to be making disciples of all different kinds of people, not just those that we think are worthy of it and who think will actually listen to us. Because God tells Isaiah that people likely will not listen to him. He'll preach, but people probably aren't going to listen. And the same could very well be true for us. We might talk to people and they might not listen at all. That doesn't mean we shouldn't share the news, the good news, with those people. Because we don't know who will be impacted by the message and hope of the gospel. We don't know what God is going to do with the seeds that are planted in people's hearts. Remember, this is all about God working, not about our abilities, not about somebody's 
desire to listen. It's about the power of God and what he can do in hearts around us so that others might come to repentance. He wants our stories to be everybody's story, recognizing a need for a savior and coming to him, asking for forgiveness. The apostle Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. God wants all people to be saved, to come to repentance. He wants us to be his witnesses, to tell others about the incredible work that God has already done in your life and about the work he's still doing in your life. Jesus tells his disciples in Acts chapter one, verse eight, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. We just saw a baptism today. Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's been given to each of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord. And because of that, he says, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We are Christ's witnesses. God wants to use you and me to share the good news about Jesus, the Son of God, so that others can come to repentance and become children of the Most High God. And I believe that the fact that God has saved us, all of us sinners, even though we didn't deserve it and still don't deserve it, I believe that should be what spurs us on and motivates us to tell others about Jesus. If God can do that for us, he can certainly do that for others. So as I close this morning, let me encourage you one last time. Go and be witnesses for Jesus Christ. This is the mission that every single one of us has been given. And if you don't know what to say to somebody, just tell them exactly what Isaiah did about your encounter with the Holy God. How that has changed your life, just as Isaiah shared that with us today through his story. And just as the apostles shared that with others around them, be disciple makers. Go out and reproduce your faith in others. Let's stand together. And before I pray, if you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never made him Lord of your life, you've heard the gospel this morning. Make today the day. He wants you to be saved. He wants to call you his child. If you want to accept that invitation, you can make your way over to our Next Steps prayer room on your left, where someone will be with you, meet with you, to talk with you about that. Or maybe you're just feeling burdened or overwhelmed. You just need prayer for something today. Feel free to also make your way over to our Next Steps prayer room, where someone will meet you and will gladly listen to you and gladly pray with you. You can do that now as I close in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the story of Jesus and what that means for us, that even though none of us are worthy, he is worthy. And because he's worthy, he laid down his life for us so that we might enter into your presence through him. Father, may, be, may he be glorified through us as we tell others about him. Present opportunities in our life. Open doors to us that we can see opportunities to share the good news with others around us. Each of us are around other people who need Jesus. Open our eyes, help us see that and give us the words to the Holy Spirit to do so, to be your witnesses, understanding exactly what you've done for us. Pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. You be seated for our time of communion. Commun communion is all about remembrance. Jesus said in Luke 22, 19, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He tells us to always take commun communion, remembering him in a sacrifice on the cross. So as we enter into our time of communion, this is a time for us to reflect on what Jesus did on the cross for us. He told us to take the bread to remember his broken body, which is beaten, spat upon, and hung on the cross for us. Jesus said no one could take his life unless he willingly laid it down. So in love and obedience to his Father, he laid down his own body on our behalf. He put his body on the line for us. Isaiah 53.5 says that he was crushed and broken for our sins. 
This is what we should remember as we take the bread, symbolizing his body that was broken for us. Jesus also tells us to remember that he poured out his blood for us. The cup tells us to remember his blood that was shed for us. His blood was cleansed and has made a way for us to receive forgiveness of our sins. His blood shed on the cross has purified us and has allowed us to enter into a covenant relationship with God. It reminds us of the everlasting commitment that God has made to us and that we have made to God by confessing Jesus as Lord of our lives. The cup symbolizes his blood and should remind us of our adoption into the family of God because Jesus died for us. What he did in the cross has made all of this possible. His broken body and the pouring out of his blood has made forgiveness possible for our sinful, lost, and broken souls. It has brought us healing, so let us remember his sacrifice and the amazing gift it has brought us. With joy and gratitude, let's pray. Father, thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. Thank you for the relationship and the healing we have because of him. As we take communion together, may we do so in remembrance of him. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you, Jesus. Well, thanks so much for joining us in worship this morning. If this is your first time with us or if you've never filled out one of our connection cards, uh, they're located on the seat back in front of you. So if you don't mind filling one of those out, just your name, your email address, wait for us to connect with you, say thanks for worshiping with us this morning. Uh, before I do anything else, so I don't forget, <laughs> the, we had our rummage sale this last weekend for Operation Christmas Child. Uh, I was told the number that, that they raised for that, which goes to the postage, is that right, to, the shipping, to be able to, to send those boxes overseas. And they were able to raise $3,200 as the count right now. So. And if you were involved in the rummage sale in any way, if you were there helping or maybe you donated some things, if you don't mind, let's stand so we can recognize you if you helped in some way during the, the rummage sale. All right. Thank you for what you did, and, and it's an amazing amount you were able to raise. Uh, the Lord was certainly blessing that. Uh, just a, a few announcements. I just have two announcements. Uh, you can kind of look through uh, your bulletin, see what's coming up. But of course, I want to remind the, the teens, we've got youth group tonight starting at 5 to 8 p.m. So I hope you can join us for that. Uh, and then next Sunday is uh, for pre-K through elementary families. Uh, there's an outing to Jacob's Orchard with uh, Michael and the kids programming there. So uh, if you're wanting to go to that, see him, talk to him. Uh, the lunch will be provided here, I believe. Is that correct? Michael will provide lunch. So free lunch. I mean, come on, you know. So if you have kids, if you're a family that has preschoolers or elementary kids, love for you to be able to, to join that. Uh, and I think that's even, uh, that's the whole family. So even if it's teenagers have siblings that are in elementary, they can, they can come as well. So uh, mark that on your calendars. That'll be a great time. Uh, that's immediately after the worship service next Sunday. Uh, that's all the announcements that I have. So if we can go ahead and, and stand and we'll dismiss with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you once again for this morning. Uh, we were able to worship you. We pray that you are glorified and, and uh, as we go out of these walls and go into our community, we can continue to glorify you and be lights for you. Uh, may, this, may we leave feeling refreshed uh, by each other's fellowship and encouragement. Uh, and may that motivate us to live a life that uh, glorifies you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.